So, um, of course, many of us watching, listening, have cell phones in our pockets, and each of those phones, for instance, has about 60 different types of metals in it. And apart from that, you know, we're seeing increasing standards of living, developing economies, and movement towards electrification of the transport sector and generation of renewable energy. And so all of those really require a vast amount of metals, cobalt, nickel, copper, gold, manganese, and so on. And this has led to an increased interest in the extraction of minerals from the deep sea bed. So there are three main deep sea mineral deposits that are being sought after. All of them are very different in nature, where they're found and what communities live on them. First, we have polymetallic nodules. Those are potato sized accretions of metal that sit on the abyssal sea floor like cobbles on a street between four and six and a half kilometers depth. Polymetallic sulfides that are found at hydrothermal vents on mid ocean ridges and back arc basins, um, and that's between one and four kilometers depth. And then cobalt rich crusts, which are found on seamounts between one and two and a half kilometers depth. And as you can see, each has different key metals that they're being targeted for. So if we talk a little bit more about the mining process, while those resources may differ in many ways, those three resources, the processes of mining will generally be quite similar in all three habitats. So sort of glossing over it, essentially we'll see mining machines that will remove the resource from the seafloor. They will then be pumped up to a surface ship. Um, where it will then be dewatered and then wastewater will be released back into the ocean at a depth that is, has not yet been decided on. And of course, the, these actions are likely going to have do some damage in the in um, the local and regional areas. So we're going to see destruction and removal of the sea floor and the and the habitat um, where the mining actually occurs, and that will result in a loss of life and biodiversity in the direct path of the machines. We're also going to see from that mining process sediment plumes, almost like dust storms, being kicked up by the machines um, at the seafloor. And additionally, we're going to see sediment plumes from that return water from the ship in the water column as well. And those sediment plumes really have the possibility of spreading that mining footprint much further horizontally and vertically. So essentially the impact stretching much further as a result of this. We're also going to see changes to seawater and sediment chemistry, as well as, for instance, light and noise pollution that would never have occurred in these areas. And so overall, given the connected nature of our oceans, really we're going to see um, a footprint that extends way beyond the actual mining operation. And then, that will not only be on the sea floor, but also in the water column, which Jeff will tell you a little bit about after. Um, and that means that there could be far reaching impacts on, for instance, the how the ecosystem functions and not only how it functions, but the services that it provides to us, such as, um, you know, uh, essentially supporting fisheries that many of us rely on or um, the ocean's ability to uptake heat and sequester carbon and so on. So I'm sure many of you have seen maps like this before, but essentially where's the mining going to potentially take place? Well, um, of course we have black areas on this map, which are exclusive economic zones. Those obviously fall within the jurisdiction of that national country. And then the blue is, are areas beyond national jurisdiction, international waters, which falls under the jurisdiction of the International Seabed Authority. And all the minerals in that area that are governed by the International Seabed Authority or regulated by the International Seabed Authority are called the Common Heritage of Humankind or Mankind, sorry, which means that they belong to every single person in this, in this virtual room, every single person on the planet, but also everyone that's yet to come as well. And so far, there have been 30 um, areas of seafloor that have been leased for mineral exploration as a precursor to deep seabed mining. Um, or the actual extraction, exploitation, which you can see here. The nodules are the red, um, the green are the polymetallic sulfides, so the hydrothermal vents, and then the orange off to the right are the seamounts or crusts. And now these 30 leases really may not look that comprehensive in the grand scheme of the ocean, but 
when you think that this is actually the sort of the, the levels of resources out there, um, really, you know, this, if it's not done um, in a very responsible way, this could be the largest industrial action that we're seeing in our oceans ever, potentially, in the future. So it really is something that we want to consider and make sure is done in a, in a, in a responsible way. So the second resource, oh sorry, the first resource are polymetallic sulfides that are found at hydrothermal vents. And these are areas where superheated chemical and metal rich fluid gush from the sea floor and they form these metal chimneys and power ecosystems in the process. And we've only known about these habitats since 1977, so less than 50 years. And really the habitat area is rich with life, as you can see, and rich in metals, of course, as well. And globally, if you added up all the areas that um, where there are active hydrothermal vents, it would be about 50 kilometers squared, which is smaller than you know, many Pacific islands. So these are relatively quite rare habitats. And this, this actual vent that you're seeing here was discovered um, off of actually the Marianas. Um, and it was 10 stories tall and it was only discovered for the first time in 2016. So really, I just wanted to include this video to show that these are places that we are still discovering and, and trying to understand. And active vents have very different fauna depending on where they sit. Um, so for instance, like uh, how forests and continents have different animals and are, and are very different in their conditions, it's the same thing for vents depending on the oceans. And 80% of named species found at hydrothermal vents live only there. Many of them have unusual adaptations. For instance, they use chemical energy to create their food. They can manage extreme temperatures, extreme chemical concentrations. And it's thought that really they provide us with clues as to how life evolved on this planet, but also potentially how it's evolving on other planets as well. The next resource, of course, are these cobalt-rich crusts on seamounts. And these are, of course, seamounts are literally mountains under the sea. This area is from the West Pacific, where there are the most valuable crusts, an area known as the prime crust zone. You can see it um, coating the sea floor in this video. And seamounts are known to have more nutrients um, than many of the surrounding areas because of the shape of them rising off the seafloor and the current circulating around them. And that can often also, that you know, high productivity in those areas can also transcend down onto the seamount itself, where for a lot of them, we get these sort of rainforests of the deep, really dense corals and sponges that act like trees, creating this three-dimensional structure that houses lots of other life. And some of these corals and sponges have been known to get to really great ages. So for instance, there have been corals, again, from the Pacific that have been aged at over 4,000 years old, which is pretty astounding. Um, and really these seamounts are probably the, of the three resources are the habitats or the, yeah, the habitats that we know the least about. For many of them, they've never been explored and our knowledge of course is increasing, but it's not doing so at a fast enough rate. And then this video is from um, a nodule plane, a abyssal nodule plane, called, which is in the clarion clipton zone. And that's, of course, I'm sure many of you are aware of this, it's between Hawaii and Mexico. And it's where the most valuable nodules have been found, and therefore where there's the most mining interest currently. Um, it's one of the habitats on Earth that is the closest to pristine. And you can see the metals here sitting on the sea floor. And so far, there have been 18 leases for mining in these areas, exploration leases, I should say, granted. And 16 of those are in the CCZ. So this is, again, a really high, high interest area. And so what we've been finding through our workout in this area is that a lot of the fauna is small in size or actually lives within the sediments. So it's not like the seamounts we were seeing before. But of course, there are still some animals as well, like this fish, there are lots of corals, delicate small corals, various anemones, sponges, and so on. And many of these organisms actually rely on the nodules themselves. Um, probably about 50% of the large animals, at least, rely on the nodules. And we're also finding that many of them are unique, many of them are rare, and many of them have very small ranges, so only about 200 kilometers really for, that they would live within. And so that means that there are repercussions in terms of impacts and 
um, and sort of how they would cope with mining. So our baseline surveys also in this area have been showing that consistently that between 70 and 90% of the species collected in these areas that have been explored are new to science and a further 25 to 75% of the total species still remain to be collected, even at sites that have been sampled. So really, there is a vast amount that we don't understand about these places, and that includes that incredibly basic question of what actually lives there. So for the remainder of this, um, of this talk, I'd like, to talk, I'd like to discuss a little bit about you know, the types of knowledge that really we should have in hand before deep seabed mining begins. So scientific knowledge, in my mind at least, <laughs> can fit into two categories, basic and applied. And so baseline knowledge is really that fundamental knowledge that's gathered during exploration and should be known prior to exploitation. It's what essentially all of the impacts that will be weighed against and sort of sets the context for management. And of course, informs things like environmental impact assessments and um, regional environmental management plans and so on. It's really what everything relies on. And so this is an example of what is required for an adequate baseline um, for each of these faunal groups on the left, which tend to be size categories, megafauna being the largest and microbes being the smallest. We need to understand each of these categories on the right. So, um, for instance, you know, what, how does the biodiversity and community structure vary across this area for all the size classes? What's the connectivity like? How do they vary with environmental parameters like, for instance, nodule densities? And of course, how does the ecosystem really function in this area? So really, there's, there's a huge amount that needs to be known. And this is something that um, definitely, well, is required by the ISA and, and if for any mining within national jurisdictions, again, should be part of that license that's granted that this knowledge has to be collected. So to talk a little bit about what we kind of know already, and I frame this around the CCZ, um, which is only, of course, one of the resources nodules um, and one region where that resource is found. But Currently, we know more than we ever have about the deep ocean and about these resources, but our knowledge is still very limited um, due to the difficulties of deep ocean sampling. And so some of our findings it, from recent times is that um, really we're seeing that there is substantial biodiversity in these places, especially for instance, in the CCZ. It's much far higher than we were expecting. And that also extends to things like diver you know, diversity. We're seeing that this is, these places are rivaling, for instance, other areas considered to be biodiversity hotspots like canyons off Hawaii or Antarctic fjords, places that where we know there is exceptional amounts of life, um, or sorry, diversity of life. And it's thought in the CCZ that that is in part because of the mixture of substrates. So the seafloor is comprised of both hard nodules as well as soft sediment, and that allows there to be many more niches for animals to live in. Um, so they're competing less. Um, but again, as, as we said, you know, most of the species are undescribed, really we're, as many in some places, as many as 75% of the species still aren't even known, much less given a formal name and understood, had their ecology understood. And we're also finding that, that there is a lot of heterogeneity. So things vary massively across just the CCZ, much less you know, between um, different resources or between um, different oceans. So in the CCZ, we're seeing that there are differences on one nodule, depending on you know, where on that one nodule we're talking about, to scales of, for instance, meters. You can have really dense nodules in some places and then less dense nodules. And then on, even on the scales of thousands of kilometers, for instance, from the east CCZ, there is, um, that's much more productive than the West CCZ. And so really there is still a lot that we need to understand in terms of how things like depth, how things like nodule density, how things like um, food flux to the sea floor from the surface, how those change and how they impact the life and the function of these ecosystems. But essentially a lot more to understand. But the biggest take home is that and of course, I'm focusing here on nodules, is that the fauna actually rely on the nodules. And it's the same at vents, and it's the same at seamounts. 
the fauna actually rely on the resource that is going to be extracted. And so that, of course, will have pretty big repercussions if mining does occur. Um, and, if, and yes, while we, we know more than we ever have, there's still a lot that we don't know in terms of baseline knowledge. Just very basic things like, um, you know, as we were saying, what lives there? What is the actual, what, what actual species live there? And then where do they live? How big is that area they live within? Then knowing what's there is just one step. It's about also understanding the ecology of these animals. How do they reproduce? How long do they live? But because of course, those, those, characteristics are going to have repercussions for how potentially that species might bounce back after an impact. Um, and then we know that there are certain areas of these habitats that we understand much less about. So for instance, the midwaters, you'll hear about from Jeff soon. The southern hemisphere, we know a lot less about these, hab these types of habitats in the southern hemisphere. With hydrothermal vents, we know more about the active vent sites where you see that beautiful fluid and all that luxurious life than we do about vents that are inactive, as I think you heard from Sabina yesterday about. Um, and then there's things like connectivity. How do these communities connect? Because of course that's absolutely essential to understanding how to effectively manage some way and how to design marine protected areas. Only a handful of, of studies on connectivity have been done and more urgently needed that also include ocean or, the oceanography of the areas, such as currents and so on. And I know Anna will talk a little bit about that tomorrow. And then how these areas vary over space. So from one end of the CCZ to the other, but from one contract area to the other, and also with other resource types as well. And how they vary over time. Life in the deep sea can be very, very slow as, I, as I'm, thinking you probably heard from Brina yesterday. And so that means that we need to understand that natural variability over, over normal, you know, over time, because that will give us real clear clues as to how these ecosystems will be able to recover from impacts. And then the functions, we don't quite understand how these ecosystems function and much less how they, those functions lead to services that we rely on, such as the cycling of carbon, nutrients, metals, and so on, what role they play in our fisheries, and so on. We know they play a role, but we're just not quite sure of the mechanisms of that. And then the second type of knowledge is applied knowledge, and that's sort of all based around the potential environmental impact from deep sea bed mining. We need to have that baseline knowledge that can then feed into our applied knowledge, which will assist in management, and that's things like um, you know, what indicators we're going to be looking for to tell us that we've potentially moved into a dangerous point with deep sea bed mining. And that will really require a lot of quantitative knowledge where essentially what are the indicators of ecosystem health? What are the threshold values for harmful effects? Like really, how do we um, manage mining in the best way possible and and before you even get to that, like how do you, what essentially, how do we understand the risks associated with mining and weigh up whether they're worth that, um, worth it moving forward. So there have been lots of pilot studies, um, not quite pilot studies, disturbance studies um, that have been on very small scales. For instance, this is a picture of one here um, that was done off of, uh, in the CCZ, yes. And, and this shows actually a 26 year old track from that disturbance. And so really you can see there's not a lot of recovery there. And um, it's these types of studies that really are gonna help us to get that applied knowledge to let us understand how these areas will be impacted and potentially how we can you know, remediate some of those impacts or mitigate some of those impacts. Um, so to go a little bit more in depth, I'm nearly, nearly to the end. We'll breeze through a lot of this. Current applied knowledge that we have is that we know there'll be a loss of biodiversity, as you heard already. There'll be removal of the habitat, sediment plumes, changes to seawater chemistry, sediment chemistry. Essentially, a lot of the impacts from mining, we know there'll be impacts. And so it really, it's about taking that next step into how do we manage those effectively. So 
while we expect many of the impacts um, on the previous slide, there are still many unknowns around the nature, the severity, the implications, and the mitigation of these environmental impacts. For instance, how do we actually define what is harmful? What is serious harm? What are the indicators of ecosystem health and the values in terms of like, for instance, sediment concentrations in the water column that we really need to be looking for to define that yes, harm is being created or harm is not being created. And that will then allow us to set those rules. What will be the extent of the impact spatially and temporally? Will recovery occur? I mean, in, for perhaps some of these habitats, but most certainly not for the habitats that you know, rely on the, um, the hard substrate, the nodules and the vents and so on. What are the extinction risks? Yes, we know there'll be biodiversity loss, but does that translate into species actually going extinct? What will be the impact on ecosystem services? We're still not sure. And what is the likelihood of remediation and restoration? This is something we're hearing being discussed over and over. And unfortunately, given the success of, of various restoration projects in shallow waters and mangrove areas and so on, I think it's pretty safe to say that you know, this will be very difficult if it is something that we move forward with and may not at all be successful. And then finally, you know, what will, mining is obviously potentially, if it moves forward, going to have really great, potentially grave impacts for the area where mining takes place, potentially further afield. But how will those impacts um, interact with other increasing impacts in the ocean, like pollution, like climate change, like fishing, um, which occurs in some of these areas. Really, there's a lot we need to understand about those interactions with other stresses. So to close, you know, regarding the deep ocean, we sometimes forget that we're really still very much in a discovery phase, that there is this overused expression, I've used it several times throughout this, this presentation, of knowledge gaps. And really, that doesn't convey the fundamental knowledge that we lack about the deep ocean and about these habitats. The CCZ is an area that is the size of the continental USA, and I'm just using that as one example. But it is extremely remote and difficult to study, and it's the same for many of the other areas where mining will take place. So attempting to understand this at, an, at a level that is needed for effective management really requires substantial time, effort, and resources. And even though we have more data than we have ever had, we shouldn't really be complacent. These data gaps still exist, and we need more time. Um, and allowing more time will essentially aid in making, allowing us to make informed decisions and ultimately manage deep ocean and extractive industries there more effectively.